Michael Garvin is the former technology transfer specialist for the University of Iowa, where he designed entrepreneurial studies courses. He has developed seven startup companies in the state of Iowa, Wisconsin, and Texas. True to both definitions of a paradigm shift specialist, Garvin has spent the last 20 years helping to affect changes in complex systems in the economy. Garvin lives with his wife, Bonnie, and their teenage twin daughters in North Liberty, Iowa. He will be unveiling the Global Energy Abundance and Sustainability Plan 2050, a strategy to align all energy sources to combat carbon release and curb energy poverty worldwide. He'll actually uh, be maybe traveling overseas here in the next few months to present uh, a, a presentation similar to this one you're seeing today. So, please welcome Mr. Michael Garvin. Well, thank you so much for that warm welcome, and I want to thank Jennifer and all the people, Leon, everyone involved in this conference. It's just been a spectacular experience for myself and my wife, Bonnie, who's part of this effort through our efforts with the uh, Illinois Institute of Technology and the University of Iowa and our company, uh, uh, the uh, Renace Group. So thank you so much. I think they deserve a hand. They've done a great job. And I want to thank all the speakers today. Every speaker set a foundation for my presentation, and I just can't thank them enough. For, from Sarah to Bob, Leon, uh, the, the, whole, the whole group, Jennifer, of course, uh, because every time they'd say something, I'd go, well, I can just pick up on that. And one of the things I'd like to pick up on right away is, uh, is the addiction theme that Leon brought up on how do you deal with addictions, and certainly uh, not just the United States, but because uh, I'm going to expand. We've talked a lot about the United States and what we can do with our environmental problems and carbon release, but I'm going to focus on a global um, stage. And certainly the global stage, if anything, has more of a connection and dependency on fossil fuels in the United States. And they're taking different routes to, to curb that. But I, I think about uh, fossil fuels in, in, a, in, a, in a kind of a comical way. I love Woody Allen, and he made a movie back years and years ago, and now I'm dating myself along with Leon. Um, Annie Hall, it was, a, it was an Academy Award winner, and there is, a, there is a line at the end of that movie that I just love, and it, and it, and it reminds me of our relationship with fossil fuels. Um, a guy goes into the psychiatrist and says, listen, I've got a problem, my brother thinks he's a chicken. And the psychiatrist says, well, why don't you bring him in? I'll see if I can cure him. He said, no, no, I can't do that because I need the eggs. <laughs> well, it's a lot like that. We all need the eggs. We want reliable energy at a low cost. But now we're asking, my golly, can we do it without carbon release? And I think I've got some very, very good news for you in that regard today. We're going to be talking, in fact, actually, this will be the unveiling here at Graceland University of a plan. It's called the Global Energy Abundance and Sustainability Plan, or the Genus Plan. The Genus Plan is developed over, I think, probably years and years of research and collaboration, a global effort uh, through uh, networks that I know abroad and here in the United States, university-based. Uh, association based with coal, with wind, with solar, not so much natural gas, and I'll address, address that in a little bit, uh, but hydrogen and hydraulic fuel cell, and I'm connected with the, uh, the Consortium of Fuel Cell Research through the Department of Energy. Uh, we see about everything there is through the Galvin Center, the REACH program at uh, the Galvin Center for Electricity Innovation at Illinois Institute of Technology, and REACH stands for Renewable Energy Applications for Conserving Humanity. So why, in all logical thinking, would the American Coal Council ask me to present a special presentation at their August uh, annual symposium in Park City, Utah? We'll get into that. One thing I do, and Leon, again, touched on it, if we're going to solve this problem, of global climate concerns and air pollution, whether it's here in Las Vegas or Chicago or, or Beijing, 
we have no luxury to call names. We have no luxury to really create a loggerhead between any energy group. We just don't have that time. We don't have that luxury. So I avoid talking about myself as being an environmentalist or pro renewable energy, even though my company, Bonnie's and my company, is named Renewable Energy Network for Aggregated and Integrative Services. And I work for a major program called Renewable Energy Applications for Conserving Humanity. But I don't have that much. Even though I know the tremendous things that we've heard about all day, with solar and wind and all kinds of different things. I neither have the luxury of saying I'm, I'm, I'm pro-fossil fuels, even though I'm welcome into most of the fossil fuel headquarters and work with Peabody Energy out of, out of, out of St. Louis and, and uh, the American Coal Council and the World, World Coal Association and, and China, the groups there, where 80% of the energy is derived from coal. Um, I am basically a citizen of planet Earth, working hard to form alliances with any and all who are willing to solve the problem of energy poverty and climate issues, atmospheric issues. That's all I am. I don't want to cause any rifts, conflicts, or battles. I just want to solve a problem. The only thing I call myself is I am a facility, facilitator of paradigm shift. And that just goes so well with the name of this conference, Changing Paradigms. So, when I talk about breaking through the climate impasse to a real energy paradigm shift for sustainability for people and planet, I am dead serious about that. Uh, I've talked to you about who I am, what I do, but we've got to get the same goal. I don't care if you're in fossil fuels or wind or solar or whatever you're involved in. The goal is to ensure sustainability for all peoples and our planet. This is the greatest challenge, I think, that has ever faced humans in the, all of history. Our goal is to balance the need of eradicating global energy poverty. And we haven't talked about that much today because we've been talking about the United States and we do not generally have energy poverty here. But folks, I'm here to tell you that 70% of the 7 billion people on Earth do face inadequate energy sources or no energy sources. And I think if you take a look at the encyclical from Pope Francis, he talks about that. That there is a difference between south and north hemispheres. Because it's just that simple. And we're going to be seeing some very sobering statistics along that uh, area. Ending the devastation of energy poverty. This is an Ebola clinic in Sierra Leone. Behind me sits a system that will change the world for African nations, I believe. It's a little two kilowatt unit that's solar, supported by lithium batteries, that can provide one critical aspect, and that is energy to power vaccine refrigeration. 80% of the people who died during the Ebola clinic, or the Ebola outbreak in Western Africa, was not, were not getting vaccine because they could not store the vaccine because there's no electricity, for heaven's sakes. This unit is manufactured in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. It took us a year and a half to find it. And now we're negotiating with the Sierra Leone government to provide energy to the family of this man who died because he did not have energy. Energy is the source of everything. Food. Because you can get irrigation. Education, because you've got lighting and com computer access and telephone access. Building, well-being, and we, I can document it all up and down the street. When you've got good, reliable energy, you've got standard of living. So devastation of energy poverty in the United Nations, and this will be discussed at the COP21 summit in, in, uh, in, in Paris, We've got to address energy poverty. We cannot no longer afford just to talk about climate issues and atmospheric issues. We've got to talk about the number one thing in the encyclical is the unfairness and the social justice issues about not having 
energy to those people, as, as we, we heard from Sarah, those people we should be caring for. So ending the devastation of energy poverty is critical. And look at 3.6 billion people have no or only partial access to electricity. Look at the size of these numbers. This is in millions of people. Millions of people have no electricity. It's in yellow. Look at all of that. And Pope Francis is right. Most of that is in the southern part of the world, not in Europe and not in the United States and, and, and North America. Absolutely not. Then the second challenge, and this is the most difficult thing and the thing that keeps me up at night, how do we balance eradicating energy poverty with combating air pollution for health and the environment? This is the Beijing street. And it does look like that. We've had teams over there where they had to come home early because they were developing lung problems as concern about lung cancers. So these are the issues, simple as this. I'm a Midwest person, originally from Nebraska, lived in Wisconsin, Missouri, now in Iowa. We have a, a very great gift here in the Midwest. Look at things as simply as possible and then get her done. Figure out a way and get her, don't talk about it anymore, let's just do it. But to balance energy poverty eradication and air, air uh, combating air and uh, atmospheric problems, really, really critical. Really, really critical. Now, I have some good news for you. We can do this. But it also includes climate change. And we've talked a lot today about climate change and the seriousness for our food sources, our living conditions, rising, uh, uh, rising ocean levels. Uh, we do have a problem here, but it's all linked with release of carbon. And I'm going to be talking a lot about, if you're going to villainize something, villainize carbon. Not any one energy source, just can we not take carbon out? I mean, think about it. If you people were in the 60s and 70s, we used to have lead in paint. We used to have lead in gasoline. Now, we didn't close Sherwin-Williams down or ask for their demise or mobile. We simply rolled up our sleeves and got the lead out, literally and figuratively. <laughs> I think we've got to stop pointing fingers and laying blame and just get to work and getting the carbon out. That is my, one of the things I'd like you to take away today. We need to get the carbon out. Lessons learned, and this has been said time and time again, when we were facing days after Pearl Harbor in the 19, 1940s, we had three technology sets to develop. Simple as that. Everybody knew it from the Pentagon down to the, the, the grunt soldier. We needed to identify technology sets for aircraft carriers, long-range bombers, and high-speed armored tanks. And we did that. By 2000, or 1943, we were, we were developing and putting these out uh, by the thousands, and it won the war. It helped win the war. We know the energy technologies that we need to respond to the energy poverty, environmental sustainability crisis. We know that. I can list the five, and I have in, in my articles. And most of the people I work with know those five. Now, would I ask for the government's efforts to this level? Yes, I would love the government's level to this, that we stop making cars for three years and just make this equipment. Will it happen? Probably not. But we should have that sort of, of urgency if we're really going to combat this. Here's the thing, and this is the, the, the paradigm shift that we're looking at, but we've got to adjust our, 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 our observation. If we're just talking about the United States, a lot of the things that were talked about today, yes, we can do it. We can get wind, we can get solar, we can get different technologies. But we're not facing that, and this is not a United States-driven solution. It can't be, because look at it. We only produce this much carbon. Look at China. Look at India and Asia, right in there. Those are the big growth factors. China is driving the solution for this. Now, the good news is President Peng just announced that there's going to be a cap-and-trade on carbon program in 2017. That's huge. The fact that he and the White House signed an agreement to curb uh, carbon last, last winter, that's huge. 
Now let's see what happens in Paris, but it looks very likely that the tandem of China and the United States is going to drive over a hundred signatories of this uh, agreement. Not a treaty. You know why? Because you'd have to take it through Congress. It's not going to be called a treaty on this side of the pond. No way. <laughs> so, China drives everything that we're doing with carbon and climate. So we have to have a realistic approach to that. If we're going to have a realistic approach, we've got to understand that China wants to solve this problem as much as we do. They have protests because of air quality. Now they're getting the upper strand of successful Chinese family having kids come up with asthma or lung conditions. That's not going to spend. We work with China a lot. And they're as interested in solving this problem as any. But they're between a rock and a hard place because coal, which is 80% of their energy source, has been the reason they've pulled hundreds of millions of people out of poverty. Hundreds of millions of people. And they're moving west into the provinces, getting more and more. So President Ping does not have an enviable position because <coughs> they've got to put 200 new coal-fired power plants online in the next five years. Everything we do to curb carbon is going to be more than offset by those 200 power plants. Then you add another 150 in India, forget it. We have very little say in climate and atmospheric conditions. It's China and India. Guess what? Who is the most technologically savvy country in the world? It's the United States. And China's begging for technology to help them out. Even Pope Francis said, listen, with your research centers, and this was his address to Congress, with your research center, I pray, I pray, get the technologies to solve this problem that I mentioned in my encyclical. So we think we have the five, and they're in varying levels of development. Now let me tell you something about paradigm shifts and getting beyond the, the cli climate energy poverty impasse. We, like I said, we don't use emotionally charged language. It's not us against them, it's us with them. It's us with them, whether it's coal or natural gas or whatever it might be. They're not the culprits. They're just trying to continue the coal's long history of helping us win two world wars, bringing uh, electrification to the Midwest. When I was born, we did not have electricity in our farm. By the time I was four, we did. By the time I was 18, I was going to a school in Omaha. By the time I was 20, I was at St. Louis University. You know the reason why that was happening? Because my folks had the wherewithal to do that because they could better themselves. And many of us have that kind of story. We need everyone and every energy source engaged in this problem. Fuel, fossil fuel, wind, solar, energy efficiency, hydrogen, energy storage, wave energy I'll talk about later, and hydraulic fuel cells. All of these technologies, everything we've heard about today from Tom and from others, we need to look and do the and I, this is going to shock some of you. Technological due diligence is easy. We do that all the time. It's the financial analysis of everything. Because I think Tom had mentioned also, financing rules everything. I start with financing before I'm sure if the, if the technology works. Because I'm not going to mess with it if the numbers don't work. Because the investors won't mess with it. So, whether it's wind, ocean thermal, coal, I would say compliant coal. I never use the word clean coal, but compliant coal. Coal that's in compliant with what we're going to be seeing come out of Paris. Ocean currents, fuel cells, solar, hydrogen, all of these things need to come into play. Now rule two, that every major global problem, you will find some level of inefficiency. Why is it that in a coal-fired power plant, it's only 35% efficient? 70% goes up the stack of carbon. That's the energy source. Can't they use it more efficiently? I'm a very simple guy. Go use it more efficiently. Clean up the situation. Now we're seeing technologies that actually do that. We need to eliminate the inefficiencies if we're going to solve the atmospheric pollution problem. This plan comes out of years of discussion with groups like El Gore's Climate Reality 
project actually just involved with them this year, the World Coal Association, American Coal Association, major utilities, global university energy research centers, like the one at Illinois Institute of Technology, leading financial analysis universities, such as the University of Iowa, which has the second rated by Financial Times, second rated finance academy in the world, next only to London School of Economics, not many people know that, but I'm, uh, I'm a facilities director for projects there. Wall Street investors, people in Iowa that have billions of dollars, why aren't they putting into this? Because we haven't made a strong enough argument for that. Solar industry, small and large wind industry, hydrogen industry, fuel cell industry, and of course the Department of Energy and global government agencies in China and in India and Australia. This is my world. This is the network that I communicate with all the time. And I only do two things, technology due diligence and financial analysis. And then Katie bar the door. If those both come in strong, we got a winner. Okay, we talked about paradigm shift facilitator. This isn't my first rodeo. My first rodeo was back in 19, uh, I guess, 78, 79. Well, it started in 84 to 90, 97, and it had to do with air quality. I was working at the University of Wisconsin, and then people came to me and said, we're finding uh, cancer clusters around hospitals. What do you think that's all about? Well, it might be about, you might, the light blue, you see, 5,237 hospital-based incinerators that had no pollution equipment on them. And we said, that, that's a problem. So here was a real learning experience. I went to the American Hospital Association. She said, this is a problem. I said, no, it isn't. Why? <laughs> well, because it costs too much to retrofit those. Yeah, people are dying. No, they're not. I said, just a second. They're dying. Or... No, they move closer to hospitals so they get better treatment. Oh, give me a break. Time out. So two years of research to find out zip codes for these people. Nobody was moving next to hospitals. It was the lead, cadmium, zinc, mercury that was coming out of the stack that was an open burn. So I basically went to Houston. I don't know if Bob's still here, but Houston is a, a place uh, that controls a lot in our life, especially in energy, but it controlled waste. Waste management was there and Browning Ferris was there at the same time. I went in, what, I was 27, 28. I said, excuse me, board of directors, but couldn't we do something about this? I said, no, we can't do it. I said, what if I gave you a financial picture where you can increase your profits and the hospital can in decrease their costs? So six months later, I came back with a plan, finance driven, and they bought it. And what we achieved was this. We shut down all of those incinerators in 13 years and left 23 permitted, completely equipped with air quality capture equipment, and our skies, our air was much better off for it. Paradigm shift. And it was driven by financial arguments. That was the key. Second paradigm shift, I was because of the success there, I joined from the University of Wisconsin, University of Iowa, University of Virginia. Actually, the University of Virginia won the MacArthur Genius Award in 2002 for this work. My work was to develop the technologies to help the healthcare industry not see their healthcare workers die because of accidental needle sticks stemming from AIDS patients. We were losing about 200 medical professionals a year because of accidental needle sticks. So I went to chief administrators uh, all over the country and the big response was, why aren't, why aren't they more careful? <laughs> why aren't they more careful? Now this seems really prehistoric, doesn't it? But back then I would go down to a, uh, an Italian delicatessen in Madison and get pickle barrels that were about this big and bring them up and put them in surgery areas so that those big epidural needles could go in there because they were going in normal trash back in 87. All needles were going in uh, normal trash. And we tried the ethical argument, the moral argument, whatever you wanted. Nobody would go two steps further to put a contaminated syringe into a needle box disposal. They'll throw it in the trash. 
Why is it that 70% of those who died from accidental needle sticks were housekeepers? Why is that? Why is that? Still gives me some sleepless nights. But we corrected the problem, and today you could not go into a, a, a bathroom in an airport or a hospital or a whatever. You've got needle boxes all over the place. Sage products should give me a check every year, but they don't. Because we started Sage in Crystal Lakes, uh, Crystal Lakes, Illinois, to solve this problem, and they did solve it. And then I worked with Becton Dickinson and Johnson Medical, and we did design after design after design on safety devices. I give plasma, I donate plasma every week. They're using the same devices we created in 1992, because they work. Drivers and paradigm shift, let me just share some stuff. Without a vast amount of money, ethical and moral arguments are not good drivers for paradigm shift. Not good drivers. I can talk blue in my face and someone will say, well, yeah, but it costs more. I, I can't do that. Now, if I figure out a financial analysis that saves or makes money, oh my golly, they're the greenest people in the world. They're the most ethical people in the world. They're the most moral people in the world. Now, it's, it's got to follow the money. It's got to follow the money. Government support incentives can only do so much. We're seeing solar tax credits drop from 30 to 10. Watch things drop off. Unless we can get to parity with, and we're almost there, there as Tom had mentioned. Enlightened self-interest is almost always a need for financial argument component. People, government, and corporations will always tout their greenness after the financial argument is won. After. I'm sorry. My wife is one of the only people I know that jump into things before the financial arguments. And she's just blessed with that way. Inventors develop the solution, but investors implement them. And I think we've seen that all day. And we've heard that all day. I've seen great technologies. We had a technology that was adult dissolvable plastic. And I begged the owners of the patent not to sell it off to Dow because I didn't think Dow was going to really develop the technology. You don't see dissolvable plastics. It's in a vault somewhere in New Jersey. University of Iowa Tempe College of Business does great work for us. We're developing, I don't know if you know this, but Iowa's the only place, only university in the world that has a predictive futures uh, trading market. If, if you take a look at it, it's the Iowa electronic market, it's fascinating. They usually do predictive markets for uh, campaigns like Obama against, you know, that kind of thing. But we've asked for them to develop an emerging energy technology electronic market, EDEM. And we'll base that at the Illinois Institute of Technology. For $100,000, you can get a, a system that can quickly identify out of 1,000 emerging technologies the 10 best. Oh, my God. They have 200 Research centers around the globe putting futures bets on technology. You know it right away. Asking questions like, what is the best technology to capture the 330 million cubic feet of flare gas that is burnt off every day in the Bakken oil fields? Boom. Six months later, you've got your technology. What is the best way to extract carbon from an effluent from a, a coal fire power plant? Boom. Six months later, you got your. So those kind of things need to be done. And the De Department of Energy Here's me rant on this all the time. Then fi the Finance Academy is conducting analysis. We just heard on a Skype call, as I wasn't here at the 9 o'clock hour, from 9 to 9.30, I heard about the report that the Finance Academy at the Ill or University of Iowa developing a complete analysis on this carbon conversion technology out of uh, Wilmington, uh, Delaware. Beautifully done. Taking a look at every side of things. It, it, you know, so I use universities a lot. Paradigm sh uh, shift success formula. It's got to be superior technology, performs better, more convenient, more reliable, and less cost. Reliable level of market acceptance, and this is critical. Strong return on investment. I use, you know, the, the people who made uh, John Papa John so successful. I use his network of financial analysis on Wall Street uh, to assess this. Is the internal rate of return greater than 15%? If it isn't, I can't even look at it because I can get all the way to the end and say, great technology, no one's going to fund it. I'm sorry, but that's the reality of the situation. Now, Al Gore does have some investment, green investments, that will take an 8% return on it. Okay, I'll go with them. 
but the big money, the billions and billions of dollars, 15% internal rate of return or greater. And we understand that. Qualifies for financing and insurance, because when you have an emerging technology, one of the best ways to get it to market <coughs> excuse me, is to put a performance bond on it. You know, Wells Fargo, all these insurance groups will put a performance bond on it. It's going to cost you. Going to cost you. Performance bond on it will perform the claims or they'll pay. So they got to be pretty doggone sure that it's going to perform. And so all our emerging technologies have performance bonds on. Win-win situation with incumbents and dominant utilities. That's why I never tick people off. If I go to Mid-America, I want them to open the door, not shut it. I ticked off enough people in my career. U.S. American Hospital Association. They still don't let me in. But utilities love me. And I speak on the... The Smart Grid Roadshow, I, I do a lot of utility work because they, they see that I'm sincere. And that's one thing we have in the Midwest. We're, we're sincere. We want to find a, a solution to this problem. Now, global no work, uh, network that I'm working with identify technologies that reduce air emissions either by channeling them, as we're going to be talking about with carbon conversion, or just not having them generated, as we'll talk about with hy hydraulic uh, fuel cells. One of the major focuses is a coal enhancement model and technology. It's important to note that paradigm shifts infrequently occur from regulatory pressures. Very, very infrequent. Even, even with the AIDS situation, the bloodborne pathogen standard was an impetus to get the equipment we needed. It was the fact that Becton Dickinson could make more money selling safety syringes than regular syringes. That's what won the day. That's what won the day. I'm so sorry to inform you about this jaundiced view of the world. There's four phases in this plan, in the global energy abundance and uh, sustainability. And keep in mind, we're not talking about the United States, small player when we're talking about this. We're talking about India, we're talking about China, we're talking about their uh, sub-Saharan Africa. Extracting sulfur, NO2, CO2, CO out of fossil fuel exhaust, that's critical. Technologies have been developed now that takes 50 to 70% of the pollutants out of the uh, affluent stream. Now, that wasn't the breakthrough, because we've been doing that with, with carbon capture and sequester, which I'm not a big fan of. And there's a reason for that, because it doesn't get the job done. And where do you put this gaseous form anyhow? They're looking at big caverns in, in, in uh, Texas and such. It's not a good long-term solution. What is, is give me carbon that is in a dry powdered form after the process, and that's what carbon conversion does. But the big breakthrough is this, and this gets a little technical, but stay with me on this. This is, this is it. This is when you read about the 100 best uh, developments in the, in the you know, 21st century, this will be one of them. They're able to take carbon out, render it a solid form, and they do that, unlike carbon capture, at 50% parasitic raw. That means that if I've got a 100 megawatt power plant, 50 megawatts an hour goes to powering that bag house in carbon capture, 50%. That takes the profitability and the insurance and all the investors run away from that kind of situation. That's why we've got the loggerheads and the, 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 the battles we have with coal and with utilities and the EPA and the White House is over this parasitic draw. The new technology now with carbon conversion gets that down to 3.5. You can invest, you can insure, you can get a reasonable return on investment on anything you do, but you gotta convert the carbon. And we'll talk a little bit about how that works. So this is the biggest breakthrough that I've seen. The parasitic draw has gone from 50% parasitic draw to 3.5% parasitic draw. We've got to lever leverage the market value of carbon. So we've got that carbon in powdered form. Had a wonderful pizza party last night with Brian, Jennifer's husband, uh, cooking for us last night. Well, this could be made in charcoal. This could make activated charcoal. It could make, uh, you know, my golf clubs. I need a new set of woods this year. And there's carbon fibers in all of that. Uh, there's a lot of need for carbon in manufacturing and industrial. You can put it in asphalt and repave all the, uh, all the roads we need, the infrastructure redone anyhow. We need to sell that because guess what? Back to my financial analysis, it's another revenue stream that pays for that equipment. 
I'm calling for a three to five year payback just on the carbon sales. If there's carbon credits, hey, all right, now we got a year and a half. And as you'll see in a little bit, after the effluent is treated, it can be circled around and used for, for input air. And there again, you burn more of the carbon. So you get less of the effluent carbon base and you get more efficiency, eight to 12% on the power plant. Eight to 12% on a thousand megawatt power plant. You're talking about hundreds of millions of dollars savings. It all goes into the investment of portfolio and prospectus. So, working with enhanced incumbent technologies to allow carbon-based technologies to continue to function while reducing their impact on the environment. I'm not saying forever. I know we've got a 350-year span that we have coal for. We don't need that, I don't think. What we need, we need about 15 to 30 years of good research and development commercialization. So the technology we're talking about with energy storage and no release, no carbon release technology, we got the time to develop them. But during that time, we're not contaminating the environment. That's all. This is a bridge technology, as Al Gore says. It's a bridge technology. After that, we've got a lot of different thinking to do in the years 25 to 35. There's also, you know, the diesel situation. 30% of carbon released globally is from trains and ships and trucks and and diesel generators. Oh, we were down in the Caribbean. The heavy fuel oil systems and the diesel systems can all be retrofitted to capture the carbon. All right, let's get on the stage two and we'll go into a little depth more in a little bit as time permits, but from the year 25 beyond, the first stage now to probably 2035. That's the time frame we're talking about. And then to take off from what Tom Wynn said about solar and wind, I think this is a critical breakthrough. Solar and wind have plentiful and free fuel source, but have not grown past the low single digits. And it's not just because we haven't had the tax credits, because we have. But in the world stage, it's one or two percent. And it probably won't develop much more than that, even in China, where they're building out a lot. But they've got a lot more build out in coal because we don't have reasonably priced energy storage yet. But it is coming. We're seeing some promise out of Australia, we're seeing some promise out of Japan, we're seeing some great promise. Transportation fuels, again, cars and trucks, folks. 25 to, and beyond, this is driven by the EPA uh, fuel efficiency standards, which this government had, had, had the foresight to put into place. We're seeing more electric, uh, hydrogen hybrids, uh, coal source oil and gas, and I had a chance to talk with Bob a little bit about that. Uh, accurately because he had some experience with that. And then hydrogen pellets is coming out of, uh, of Europe. The problem with hydrogen is it's explosive. But what if you encapsulate those molecules in a polymer? Not explosive. And then you just gently heat the polymer before it goes into the combustion chamber. They're having great success in, in Europe. So we're going to see hydrogen pellets. I like electric. Sarah and I were talking at lunch. I like electric. We're doing some really interesting things down at Austin Energy, Austin Power. Uh, it's, a, it's a public power system. But they're doing things like running fleets of cars, electric cars. You charge at night at two cents a kilowatt. You go to work, let's say at Round Rock, which is north of, uh, of Austin, where Dell is. You got 10,000 cars coming in there. Let's say they're all electric. Eh, what if they download the surplus energy from the battery? You can run the entire complex on two cents, pay the pay the uh, the employee three cents, and they're getting a bonus. You're getting a bonus. It's transportation. We'll talk a little bit in a, a bit about road and rail-based transportation, which I think is the future of, of electricity. But that's one way to do it, and I think it's a very creative way to do it. Just on the Tesla, or you know, when we get Ford Fusion now has an all-electric car, you know, Mitsubishi does with the iMe and, and such. So, transportation. Stage four is the development of low energy uh, systems from very low fuel sources. Tom mentioned one, we've got waste energy, we've got hydraulic fuel cell. I love wave energy. We're looking at staging a project of 100 megawatts off the coast of Kenya. And I'll show you how that works. It's very simple, low maintenance, it's, it's attractive. The Department of Energy in the state of California brought it forward. I liked it, I supported it. We did due diligence on it and so far, uh, Kenya's just begging for it, just begging for it, because it's one cents a kilowatt hour. 
and that's amortization of the equipment. So ocean thermal is being done in Hawaii and down in the Caribbean, ocean currents are being done as well. So quickly going through this, we, we've, we've talked about the parasitic draw. Phase one is well on track. Uh, talked about the analogy with lead and paint and gasoline, but the, the thing that's driving this is simply, you got that parasitic draw down. Now financially it makes sense and the University of Iowa is, is, is uh, and analyzing that. World energy profiles, why do I spend so much time in fossil fuels? Because look at this, natural gas and coal make up 64% of energies used, whereas solar is 0.4, a wind is, uh, is two, but these are so small and even they grow at 100% a year, it take decades to, to overcome this. And by that time, we're probably past the 2% or 2 degrees Celsius that Al Gore talks about, and we probably have just a cleanup operation instead of a, a, a paradigm shift operation. And this is why it is. Coal usage in China, almost the same trajectory as Tom Wynn showed in wind and solar. Look at this. In India, they're not foregoing coal. And quite honestly, they make a strong argument. And it's just like, let me get this. United States, you're going to lecture us on using coal. But you had 120 years of building your economy, setting a standard of living that's second to none on coal, but now you're saying you guys shouldn't use it in India and China. Mm-mm. We had the benefits, and we contributed just like you did, but you know, now we know it's nasty stuff, so you should not use it. Ain't gonna fly. Now it's just a grace, just a, a gift from God that President Ping from China has said, listen, we're gonna do a cap and trade on carbon. Isn't that ironic? China, which is a communist centrally driven economy, is gonna do a market solution for carbon. We, on the other hand, can't get car that Congress to move, so we've gotta do a dictatorial executive order for the president's office to do so it's a weird weird world it's a weird world it really is here's the thing that drives me and i talk with the united nations foundation and the people of the united nations their first and foremost priority is energy poverty and i don't blame them if we are true to our our faith we need to take care of those who do not have if we are true to our faith, we take care of our world, too. But look at this. Bearing in mind that social and economic development, poverty eradication is the first and overriding priorities of developing countries, and low emission uh, development strategy is indis indispensable, sustainable development. We need to incorporate both. So when we talk about climate, when we talk about uh, atmospheric contamination, we got to talk about energy poverty as well, and the United Nations is all over that, and I hope we hear a lot of that from Paris, I really do. Here's what we're facing, global growth in 2050. This is when the plan, the genus plan, goes to, next 35 years. Global GDP is gonna be up 270%, they predict. Electricity generation up 130%. World population topping out over nine billion, 13 billion tons of coal used annually. Folks, if we don't, figure out a way to attack carbon. We're not stopping this train because they're concerned about energy poverty and well-being of their citizens. We're not stopping that train. We can stop the, the emission issues with carbon, and that's what we're attempting to do here. Asia accounts for 4 billion tons of demand growth uh, through 2035. Look at this in China. Look at this, 2,320 tons of coal growth. <laughs> Here in the United States, very small, 148 million, still significant, but look at India, China, and the rest of Asia, critical. Coal's growth is two times gas and nuclear and uh, hydro, look at this. This is incredible, uh, up to two, the year 2020. And this is why. Because standard of living always follows low cost energy. From economic growth to quality of life with the appliances. Fred Maytag. I mean, we were famous with our, with our manufacturing, with appliances, still are, here in Iowa. Workplace improvements, environmental progress. Critical for low cost energy. 
Strong links between electricity from coal and economic growth globally. You just see it. I mean, you can't get any closer unless the lines are on top of each other. United Nations linked affordable energy to quality of life. Look at these. United States, Australia, Japan, Germany, France. They're all up there, and that's all coal-fired and low cost. So these people want to climb up here, and we say, no, you got to use something that's less. It's not going to happen. Bangladesh, India, Vietnam, it's just not going to happen. So we've got to address carbon issues. This is just more technology or more statistics. China's 80% coal fuel, and it looks like it's going to stay that way. This is the biggest thing that I think we should do. I believe in alternative energy sources. Believe me, I do. But the reality is, to replace what we need in coal generation by 2035, it would be over a thousand solar times that we presently have. Wind, 4.6 million wind turbines, nuclear, 2,100 nuclear plants, natural gas, 4,700 gigawatts of natural gas, and hydro, the equivalent of 200 three-gorge dams. I don't know if you've ever seen pictures of that Chinese dam, but it's humongous. It, it just dwarfs anything we have here in the United States. The big thing is that fossil fuels will work with us. When I called the American Coal Council and said, I think I've got something for you, they welcomed me in because they're desperate. They don't want to be villainized, but they want to find a solution. They want to find a solution. We all know it's going to take 25 years to get this conversion paradigm shift, and they've already reduced carbon, released 80% from 1970 to now. They can go the extra 10% more if we can find the right technology. And then it's, then it's just a horse race. If we can get energy storage and wind to cost less than, uh, than coal, we're in good shape. And right now I'm hearing, even with, with energy storage, the way we think we've got it, we could probably have three to four million dollar megawatt solar and storage within a year. So, you know, I know that's four times that of coal, but it's at least in the ballpark. And this is what I want to talk about. This was a breakthrough. This was a parasitic draw breakthrough. It is a non-thermal plasma process. There's been a lot of different approaches to capturing carbon, you know, from, from a filtration to what. This is basically a chamber. And in that chamber is a cloud, kind of a misty cloud. It's a charged plasma, non-thermal plasma. So it's not hot, it's just there. But when carbon effluent comes into that chamber, something happens. It attacks the bonds of the carbon molecules and breaks them. And in that breaking, it reduces the NO2, CO2, and SO2, and is applicable to all these power plants, foundries, smelters, incinerators, natural gas power plants, diesel generators, the whole work. And technologically, it works something like this. There is a cycle with the effluent gas coming in here with a condenser, primary reactor, which is where your plasma is, and you've got the broken up, expansion chamber, baffle, this is where the rejoining comes in. So the carbon molecules rejoin with the carbon molecules, drops it into a, like a carbon black dust. The oxygen connects with the oxygen molecules and goes up the chamber. So now we're getting up to 70% efficiency. If we put more chambers like this in, can we get up to 80 or 90? That's still in the laboratory. But the commercialized Proportion is shooting for what they're targeting in uh, Paris, 35 to 50 percent reduction of carbon and effluent. So we can do that with one chamber. Now they're looking at doing two or three chambers, and that research is going on. And it goes like this: conditioning of the dirty air with all of the all of these CO2, SO2 uh, coming through hits the plasma chamber breaks in the, the molecules. Now, the beautiful thing, and how they got the parasitic draw so low, they don't use enough energy. They only use the energy to jump start the chain reaction. After that, after the first bond is broken in the first molecule, that puts off a charge, and that breaks the second. The second breaks the third, and on and on. So all you need is microamps to charge things like, like a sourdough starter. You don't have to go through the whole thing and make sure every bubble gets... No, it does it itself. And it's charged until you turn off the unit. Then you get air. Now the nice thing is, and they're doing research now in Chicago at a major corporation, they want to take the effluent and return it back as oxygen. And you'll see here in a video in just a minute how that has been working. 
I think, uh, are we close, Jen, to the video? Yeah, it was at GST slide. Okay, there we go. Let me show you a video. It's just two and a half minutes, but it'll show you the technology in action. Energy sources like oil, gas, and coal, just as clean as the new alternative energies like biofuels, wind, and solar. Imagine diesel engine at return H2O and oxygen back into the air instead of toxic pollution. Global Solutions Technology has come up with a solution that converts pollution into natural air and water. Example This is a diesel generator. Just like a typical diesel engine, it emits toxic pollution. If we take this raw exhaust and run it back into the intake of the engine, the engine will stop. This is because there is no oxygen to feed the combustion in the engine. This time, we will run the raw exhaust into the GST low emissions recirculation system. and then back into the intake of the engine. The engine continues to run. There is plenty of fresh oxygen to feed the combustion chambers in the engine. This diesel engine can recirculate its own emissions and run more efficiently. Plus, it's completely friendly to the environment. That's because the GST low emission system is designed to eliminate all harmful waste emitted from combustion and <coughs> is using non-thermal plasma technology. The difference in our technology is that a scrubber removes possibly 30 to 60 percent of the emissions coming off the system. We remove 100 percent of the total airstream emission processes, CO2, nitrogen dioxide, sulfur dioxide, carbon monoxide. We're not chemically associated, we're fully electronic device, and we operate very efficiently. GST has installed a unit at the water treatment plant of Wilmington, Delaware. They were able to reduce their pollutant percentage from over 40% to less than 5% instantly. This system will provide low emissions, which will exceed EPA standards while increasing efficiency of power generation. With this technology, coal-fired power plants, diesel engines, industrial engines, landfill gas, and shale gas recovery can have similar emissions as wind, solar, and biodiesel. Now that's a solution. That's GST. I don't think I'd go as far as saying uh, equivalent to a solar and wind. What I'd say is it looks like it can easily meet the 35 to 50 percent reduction uh, requirements that we're likely to see out of Paris. And that's what I'm most interested in. And it pencils out at about $200,000, $250,000 a megawatt hour. Uh, you know, we're looking at, uh, you know, working with coal industry to start retrofitting uh, some Midwest uh, plants right away. So it looks pretty promising. Jen, you might need to move it. Um, I'm, there we go. So you can see the numbers here, and I'm not going to Give us about a year to confirm all these numbers, but it looks awfully, awfully promising. And then the sale of the carbon black, some of the, the team goes, forget about the carbon black, let's just get the energy efficiency up. Uh, others say, no, energy efficiency, carbon credits, uh, sale of the carbon, all factor in and get a higher profitability. Now, why aren't I talking about natural gas? Because that's supposed to be the darling of the environmental side of things right now. I have a problem with natural gas, and, and uh, uh, you know, we were talking at, at lunch with Sarah, and the problem I have was I don't think they're accurately reporting the carbon footprint. Now, if you take a coal-fired power plant and natural gas, yeah, you're going to get 32 percent less carbon coming on out of that natural gas power plant, but are they considering the fact that just in the Balkans, we've got 330 million cubic feet of flare gas, methane, being burnt off every day. 330 million people, that's three to five percent of all the electricity needs in the United States. And how about the, the Gulf, the Gulf of Mexico and all those derricks out there? How about West Texas? Uh, I've got some problems with uh, how they calculate that. The other thing is we did a price uh, 
stability uh, assessment two years ago on natural gas. We were looking at a technology out of Chicago, and there's something like 80% chance that uh, natural gas prices could spike as much as two or three times what they are today. Fracking is another issue altogether that we have to look at. How sustainable is it? What kind of lawsuits could occur on the environmental side? What are we doing with our, 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 our subsurface structure, uh, our drinking water? There's some issues that have to be addressed there. So I'm not going to factor that into the Guinness plan at all. Energy storage, I, I, I mentioned that we've got to have to stabilize wind and solar. We've got to have utility scale and residential scale energy storage. We're taking a look at Tesla coming out with a residential uh, system. They're going to just do a lease or a rental system. I think it's a brilliant model. Let's see what the numbers come in at. But in my world, if we had a one megawatt uh, storage unit for $100,000, that's it. Now, right now, people have been at, uh, into the Illinois Institute of Technology, and they said, we can give you a, a one megawatt unit, but it's $5 million. Well, okay, we're about 50 times higher than I need it to be. So we're seeing some movement, some promise, around the world, but we need to get that. And the beautiful thing is if we can get that down to 100,000 a megawatt, it isn't just stabilizing wind and solar, it's delivering the Holy Grail. And the Holy Grail to me is this. Rail-based energy transport. Now think about it. We've got 100 times the mileage, the miles, of rail in the United States than we do high transmission lines. When I took a look at the chart that, that Tom put up on the screen and, and you saw that the cluster of, the, of the, the wind and solar are all around that, hey, what if I could put solar and wind in any place where there's a, there's a rail truck? Where, what if I could put, and rail trucks are all over because they were built out for the agricultural commodities. I can find rail every place. So then, if I can get my numbers to work, I can load up a 100-car train in Montana on Friday night, and it will be in Aurora substation for Exelon uh, by um, uh, Monday morning with a 1% loss in transport. 1%. And I don't need a $3 billion plant to process it. I hook it up to the grid like batteries and put the empties on the car and turn Mr. Buffett's... Uh, Burlington Northern train around and run it back to Montana. I'd love that. You're going to have spot market sales that day. If Phoenix needs uh, peak shaving, I'll run a 100 uh, rail car down to them. If, if Atlanta needs it, if a heat uh, thing hits Atlanta or a snowstorm hits Boston, I can get you energy. So rail base is critical. And don't you think China would love that? Because they have rail build out too. So already have talked with the Northern Iowa Railway, good people up there. I would love to have a demonstration model because their manly uh, terminal is within sight of some of the biggest wind farms in Iowa. I'd love to load up a couple cars and shoot them down to Cedar Falls where the Cedar Falls utility could just hook those bad boys up. Wouldn't that be nice? And just like uh, uh, Fulton and the Fulton uh, developments, I just need to run it once and have the press there, and have it work. But if it works and the press is there, Katie bar the door, we've got energy transport. Fuel transportation, I'm, I'm running uh, short on time here, but 25, uh, 2025 and beyond, we're gonna see possibly coal-based gasolines. We're looking at that because of the low carbon release. Electric cars and electric hybrids, we talked like Sarah and I did at lunch, about them being a solution to the problem more than just eliminating carbon, but also having a transport solution to electricity, CNG trucks and cars, hydrogen pellets, I'm big on it. And this company I'm watching carefully out of West uh, England, if they can do it, uh, then it's the infrastructure. Infrastructure is a, a problem. We'll come and go in case he's sell hydrogen pellets when the oil industry will threaten to take away their gasoline licenses, Ugh, all that kind of stuff. But we'll address it when we have the technology. But we've been down to the Caribbean and Curacao, and they've looked at working with a good friend of mine, Tim Dwight, on the solar side, and Tim and I have been down there, and we can put together a really nice array of solar to support, like they have at the University of Iowa. They have an array that Tim helped put in. Tom, you might have been involved with that. Charging electric cars, that would be absolutely beautiful. 
Now, stage four is the one that I think is the most interesting. I don't spend as much time as I would like to on this, but stage four is critical. I've got another individual by the name of Lloyd Telford who runs a lot of this uh, for me. But wave energy, you know, this is 2030 and beyond, so we're 15 years out before we really see commercialization. But wave energy with a, a, a penny a kilowatt hour could come through. Waste to energy is coming on. I've got a meeting in Chicago on Monday about that. Hydrogen, we're taking a look at using hydrogen in a lot of different ways. Here's a wave energy generator, basically a culvert, 70 foot culvert, and you've got a floating, like a bobber, a fishing bobber that goes up and down with the waves. That movement pushes the water through a venturi valve dynamic in the, uh, the culvert and spins turbines in here and links it back to the, to the shore. Very, very nice and inexpensive. And you can see this is some of the energy generation by month, February, March, April. And like Tom showed before, there's some dips. You're gonna have less wave energy in June, uh, July and August, but then they come up again. But it's, it's promising, and it's base load. Generally base load. You got some dips and valleys, but generally base load. So I like it. This is the technology, it's just an artist rendering. So that looks promising, and Kenya is all over this. Putting 100 megawatts there is no problem, even financing it through the World Bank. But we've got to confirm confirmation of the technology off the coast of Catalina with the California Department of Energy. And this is just wave energy maps, it's all kinds of wave energy. Other than solar and wind, wave energy, well, wave energy is probably the most promising base load dispatchable technology or energy source that we have. We just have not started to tap it. Now we are. These are current. Uh, we're looking at doing a project down in the uh, U.S. Virgin Islands where we've got current uh, turbines that look pretty promising. And it goes something like this. Isn't this interesting? It's put together by Hydrogen 411 out of Michigan. But current turbines down here put energy back, break water into hydrogen, powers a general electric hydrogen generator, and provides shore to ship electricity. Very ingenious. And it comes in at 10, 8, 10 cents a kilowatt hour. Shore power is now 32 cents a kilowatt hour. In the U.S. Virgin Island, it's 58 cents a kilowatt hour. And now with the new EPA requirements and all U.S. ports, have the request or the demand that all ships turn off auxiliary power units. This is a very, very big thing. Like uh, Bob was saying, opportunity, oh my golly. So we're working with a lot of the major globals to, to get a solution to zero emission shore to ship installation, critical. Waste energy is just coming into its own, just coming into its own. University of Iowa now is uh, having 20% of their fuel as Oathalls from Quaker Oak. Beautiful thing. Now they're contracting with farmers from Miscanthus grass. So next year they'll be uh, burning 50% uh, biomass and 50% and coal. Changes, challenges ahead. What I'm asking you, I'm asking everyone to have a discussion. Now this is a global discussion, not just in the United States. Not just in the United States. It, and it's a technologically driven, not paradigm shift on a regulatory basis, but a, a financial market driven situation. It's, it's really, really critical. I think of uh, Yogi Berra. Yogi Berra, and I, when I was helping put this into perspective on this conference, I thought, why don't we work more about the solutions? rather than bemoaning, bemoaning the fact that climate change or atmospheric contamination is occurring. <laughs> Why don't we have a dozen plans like the global energy uh, 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 availability or abundance and sustainability plan there? I want to see dozens of those. And I think of Yogi Berra, who just passed on this last month, and one of his great yogiisms saying, uh, we don't know where we're going, but we're making good time. <laughs> so I think it's time to understand we need to know where we're going. Pick a plan. If you got a better one than this one, better one than Genesis, God bless you. Bring it forward. But we need a plan. Let's have a plan and let's make good time at the same time. So thank you so much for being with us today.